I was asked to share or to talk about seminary versus, versus university. And when I think of seminary and university, I basically think of the life of Apostle Paul. We all know that he was a well-educated person. Probably he would have, uh, we would consider him to have gone to a very nice university. He had all that it took for him to know about the law and the traditions of the, uh, of the Judaism. And he was serious about it. He lived a life that did not portray what he had actually learned. Because we know that he was a persecutor of the church. The law had said, do not kill, but he was, <laughs> he was among the people that were killing Christians. And therefore, looking at his life, when he met Jesus on his way to Damascus, his life was transformed. And he was sent to go to Ananias, who was to talk to him. And I take Ananias as a person that was to start discipling Paul. He had a lot of knowledge in his head, and therefore, after his life was transformed, his heart was to be, was changed, and his life was totally changed out of that. Looking at the life of Apostle Paul, we find that after being converted into Christianity, after coming to a point of knowing Jesus Christ, he became a different person. He was so well connected to the church. In his missionary journeys, we see that he would go to people, he would sleep in people's houses, he would dine with them, he would share with them the problem with the problems that they, that they had. So Apostle Paul was so much connected to the church after the transformation that he received when he received Jesus Christ. And therefore, this happens, or this is what should happen in our churches uh, or in our seminaries, whereby the students that come to us, although they, they, they gain the head knowledge, their lives have to be transformed and they have to be discipled in order to become what God, God expects of them. I look at the church as a body, and the Bible calls it the body of Christ. Its mission and purpose are found in the Great Commission, whereby we have been called, the church has been called to the Great Commission. We have been called to be disciple makers. And if this is the case, when we, uh, when we shift from disciple making, we stop being faithful to the Lordship of our Lord Jesus Christ. When the church looks at other ministries being superior to the ministry of disciple making, then they stop being faithful in following Christ. And as one of us said yesterday, that discipleship is ministry of the church. And we have seminaries which are entrusted by several churches to do discipleship. And therefore, within the seminaries, this is what we are supposed to be doing. I want to present a case for separation of seminaries from universities. And I, I totally believe that seminaries should have their place different from the place of the universities. And there has to be that separation in order for seminaries to continue being effective in making disciples. Let us look at some of the historical facts that we, ha that we have. Before 19th century, theology was taught in universities. Most of the universities that, that existed before 19th century, they ex existed basically to train ministers of the church. And as they started, 
They got to a point whereby uh, there was a complaint that most of the people that had gone to the universities for the training of ministry yeah, became uh, clerical er rights. They, they were so much educated, but they, had, they lacked that connection with the church. So there was complaints that universities were working towards training um, uh, clerical elites. The graduates from the universities were unable to fit into the life of the local church. A person would graduate from the university, go back to his local church, and there was that disconnection. Therefore, they were not well assimilated into, uh, into the life of the local churches and lost completely touch with the churches. And therefore, the universities that were started basically to help with, uh, with strengthening the churches did not do exactly what they were supposed to do. By losing co uh, connections with congregations, the studies in the universities had, had no much impact in meeting the needs of the churches and their church members. In most instances, students who are admitted into universities for theological ministry, this is another reason, changed to courses that were perceived as more attractive and would lead to more lucrative careers such as law, medicine, and business. Therefore, students would go to the university and a person would feel like I have been called by the Lord to be a minister. But the moment that student gets in the university, they would look at other students who are taking different, other different careers and, and they thought that these were the, most, uh, the, 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 the best careers. And therefore, some of them would change the programs that they were admitted for. And out of that, the number of students that were taking ministry courses continued drifting, and it, it, it continued growing smaller and smaller. And therefore, churches started lacking ministers because the people that had gone to the seminary for, uh, to the university for theological training decided to take other careers rather than ministry. The other, the other reason is that, uh, or the, the other issue that arose is that when some of the churches found that the graduates from the universities were being accused of being over-educated and lacking in piety, they decided to start their own, uh, their, their own schools. And these schools were then to help students with the issue of having literate and piety clergy. It was during such a period that schools like Harvard University, Yale, Princeton, were started. In fact, it is believed that during the first 50, uh, during the first 50 years of 18th century, over half of the students of Harvard and Yale went into ministry. Jonathan Pickering affirms that Harvard, Yale, and Princeton were founded mainly to train, to train ministers and build civilization among Christia, uh, Christianity. In Europe, universities such, such as Oxford, Cambridge, St. Andrews, and the University of Edinburgh were also established with the, with the aim of training clergy. And, and therefore, we, we, we can look at the history, the, the, that short history of what has happened in the past with the universities. Most of these universities that we, I have mentioned today have gone completely away from the ministry, uh, from, from, from the work of preparing church ministers. Let us look at reasons for universities abandoning Christian roots. For example, the university, the, 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 the university, the old universities that I've talked about abandoned Christian roots. What were some of the reasons that led into this? 
The universities accepted naturalistic worldview and compromised on scriptures. This is whereby they looked at nature and wanted to study nature, and they did not look at the scripture as the foundation of their faith and their curriculum. The move from biblical worldview to, na to naturalism led into opposing God's word, especially in the book of Genesis. They stopped viewing the Bible as foundation of faith and knowledge, and they were, when the Bible ceased to be central in teaching, the university stopped serving the church because they had, they, they had no more flavor for the church. Much of what was being taught failed to impact the church in the area or areas of faith. The foundation of Christian faith was shaken. As the Bible states in the book of Psalms, chapter 11, verse 3, when the foundation is destroyed, what can the righteous do? Yeah, the foundation of the teaching of the universities was destroyed. And Paul says in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 14, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desire, because they have each itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to feebles. Basically, that is what happened into these universities. Also, skepticism took over Christian thoughts within the cl classrooms uh, in the universities. With skepticism, universities focused more on intellect and stress on science over religion. And that, these were some of the developments that were going on uh, during those years. The approach to university education became more secularized. As Christian universities sought to improve their academic reputation, their prestige was to be realized at the expense of religious identity. The faculty and enrollment of students was no longer focused on Christian faith and practice. The, the university stopped looking at the Christian values. They, they were no longer an issue in recruiting the faculty and even in recruiting the students. So anyone who came would be admitted because the universities wanted to, to look uh, more prestigious. They attracted people that did not, uh, did not have anything to do with the Christian faith. The above reasons show that the approach of education within geological schools led to the kind of graduate school, uh, the, the kind of the graduates a school would pro produce. Students as well as church determines the direction of a, uh, of a school. And when we look at this, we need to, to remember that the purpose of the seminary is to serve the church. When that stops, like it stops during uh, these early years, then we lose a lot. What about today? How or what has caused the decline of enrollment in the seminaries today? This is an issue that most of us are dealing with. And I have a case, or several cases, among us in Kenya. We have Kenya Baptist Theological College. We've been offering a diploma in theology. And most of our students who come for the diploma of theology, after graduating, they no longer continue with their theological education. The moment they receive that diploma, which qualifies them to get into any university, they go for other courses. In fact, uh, Jack has been my principal at KBTC. We've had people 
who got their bachelor's degrees in different a other areas rather than theology, they went for their master's degrees and they had started with theology. And after graduating, they go back to the church and they feel like they're, they're disconnecting with the church because they did not take over or they did not carry on with seminary education. There is a lot of, uh, there, there is decline in enrollment of students within theological seminary. Not only in Kenya, not only in Africa, but also in other parts of the world. In looking at the decline of enrollment in those seminaries after 1985, Wata Kaisa stipulates some of the reasons uh, that, that led into that. He says that the seminary curriculum was no longer user or church friendly. The, ch the, the, the seminary would come up with a curriculum that did not really serve the needs either of the church or of the student. It, it was more academic with little or no concern for application and the needs of the church. A and therefore he says that the drafting of, or the development of the curriculum within the seminaries has been what has been putting people off from enrolling in seminary studies. Secondly, the student who graduate or the graduates of the seminary modeled profession, professionals of other academics rather than professionals of the church. He gives examples from the US, whereby when you ask a student in a seminary, why are you here? They would tell you that I'm here in order for me to get, in order for me to get a position as a staff in a church. And therefore, the student is basically looking at the professional part of it rather than the ministry. Um, this is due to focusing too much on the head with too little on ministry skill. His that reason is that the curriculum is driven by language and theological content skills, uh, skills which replaces uh, favor of more pressing needs of the church. He argues that when you go to the seminary, you you receive more of head knowledge, you study languages, you study theology, but when you go to the church, you are not able to, uh, you are not able to apply them within the context of the church. And therefore, people stopped going to the seminary because seminary education was not really helping them in their ministry. Fourth, he says that the curriculum lacks in areas, areas such as management skills, finances, relational skills, counseling, preaching, leadership, conflict management, and personal spiritual development. When a curriculum causes, uh, fails to address these areas, then people feel like it is not fit for them. As one thinks of whether seminaries should be turned into university, my question or the major question would be whether the existing seminaries are different from universities. And this is the major question I would want us to discuss after this. Are our seminaries any different from universities? And if we can answer this question, then we can see the need of seminaries uh, in relation to university. Setting priority for theological education will dis distinguish what happens in the ministry from what is happening in the university. Jack Cunning Cunningham states priorities that seminaries should set in order to meet uh, the needs of the church. 
And the, these are the priorities that one should have. I take these priorities as what would make distinction or what would bring distinction between the seminary and the church. One, seminaries need to listen to the voice of the church community in pre, uh, predicting the future needs of the church. Most of us go to the seminary, or especially for us who are teaching in the seminary, we think that we really know the need of, or the needs of the local church, and at times we don't listen to what is going on within the church. And he says that unless we do this, then there will be not that distinction between the seminary and the university. We, we need to come to a point whereby our curriculum focuses on the needs of the church. Given that the graduates of the seminary go to serve in those churches, the seminary needs to be aware of those needs. And this, however, should be done with caution. Even as the church presents uh, their problems, I say that we should do it in caution, uh, with caution because of what I've experienced over the few years that I have been in theological training ministry, whereby a certain church would tell you we want this kind of people, you are teaching theology only, and we need doctors, we need agriculturalists, we need, and they would give you a list of what you need to teach. And when you look at that, then you might drift your focus from theological education again into areas that you may not necessarily need. Number two, seminaries should interpret the term minister properly. The seminaries should interpret the term minister properly. Most of the seminary students, again, think of professionalism when they think of being ministers. They don't look at the, 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 the calling, the Christian calling, from the perspective of being servants of the church. And at times, they even forget the purpose of God's calling them into Christian ministry, which is found in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 11 to, to 16, which says, So Christ himself gave the, uh, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for the work of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every kind of teaching and by the cunning of the craftiness of people in their deceitful, uh, deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will, glow, uh, we will grow and become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is, he who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, growing and building itself up in love as each part does its work. With this understanding, seminary students need to be led into understanding, yeah, when we train you, we are training you for the profession of the church. You are going back to the church and to serve the people of God as God expects of you. That, or the, that priority is design curriculum that, uh, uh, which is elementary and accessible. This sounds uh, easy, 
And we may think that then we will be uh, watering down theological education. He says that we need to design curriculum which is elementary and accessible. As he talks of this, he talks of seminaries presenting content that does not resonate well with the students. A student may take a course, get the information, but be unable to process that information to a point whereby he can use it in his own church. I remember someone telling us that if you, if you want to use a cow for plowing, uh, uh, plowing the land, you cannot press the plow in the ground at the beginning. You start at the top, and as the cow carries on with the work of tilling the land, you keep on pressing the plow. And that is what seminaries should do. Paul told the Corinthians, uh, the Corinthians church that I'm giving you liquid or milk instead of solid food because you have not attained the maturity of that. Some of our students are confronted with hard stuff at the beginning. And when they are confronted with hard stuff in the, instead of the basics, then as, even as they continue in their theological education, they fail to get it because of the complex, complexity that was introduced to them. Let us look at the desires to, of seminaries into becoming universities and what drives us into that. There are various reasons as to why most of the seminaries, not only in Africa but in other parts of the world, want to become universities. There are two main reasons that uh, basically drive seminaries into wanting to become university. One is a desire for prestige and finances. Again, this has been talked about. A desire for prestige and finances, whereby seminaries feel like if we would become university, we will look more, uh, we will be more recognized. And when we become university, when we become a university, we'll be able to raise more money to do what we are supposed to do. This, this has been the thinking of many schools. In Kenya, I, I know basically because this is where I am, some of the seminaries that have tried to do this are almost closing. They start programs, and those programs become too expensive to run. If they, if they were to go for accreditation, they, ha they have to prove to the accredit accreditation body that yes, they have the facility and they have the staff for th that particular program. And therefore, instead of getting money at the beginning, they, they use the money that they have received for theological education for these other departments. And from my personal arguments. There are times when a student would prefer going to a, a school that has been proven in a certain area than going to a school that is starting a certain program. And therefore, the prestige that seminaries may be looking for may not be realized. And the finances that they thought they would raise may not be raised. And therefore, this becomes a misplaced reason. Secondly, there is a notion that seminaries are not offering, in quote, viable and marketable programs. We think that seminary education, especially theological education, is not viable and it is not marketable. And when some seminaries think of this, they tend to think, yeah, we can do better if we would bring up or if we develop programs that are marketable. Again, 
marketability of the programs uh, goes together with finances which are never realized. I want now to go to the practical and theological advantages of seminaries being separated from universities. Yaakov, Yaakov Kurt states that in universities, moral, ethical, and value goals are not mentioned at different levels of education. In his arguments, he talks about the, the issues of morality and ethics and values. These are not usually talked about in universities. Whereas in seminaries, we stress on the ethics and morality of both our students and our faculty members and the rest of the staff members. And therefore, when, you, when seminaries turn into universities, one of the areas in which they lose a lot is on the issue, issue of morality. Again, I can give a lot of examples from Kenya. I've, we, we are hearing every now and then that most of our children who, who are in university are living together not really married, but when they go to university, you give them money to rent a room. A, a young man would take a young girl, and they would live together in a room as student universities and share the cost. Basically, that has been the argument. And that is due to lack of morality. If that would happen in a seminary, and the seminary knows it, it would shape those students into becoming what is expected of them. The other advantage is the preservation of Christian conventions. John uh, Fallon says that department of religion within the universities are decide decidedly secular. Biblical scholars in, in, in those universities sniff at the effects of their more conventional colleagues and wonder if they are worthy of membership in particular, uh, part, uh, in participation in particular organizations such as Bible Society and Biblical Literature. The, the, the Christian conversion the, uh, is lost as seminaries become universities, whereby even the professors in Secular universities do not see the need of propagating Christian conversion, uh, conversions. Thirdly, there is freedom from the pressure of prestige and money. There is freedom, or the, the, the school is freed from the pressure of prestige and money. And this is a big advantage. It is a big advantage to the seminary in that knowing that we are serving the church and we have been called to follow Christ, a Christian is willing to deny himself, take his cross daily, and follow Christ according to Luke 9. 23. Most of us, I believe, in this room, we knew when God called us to the ministry that we were not being called to riches. We were called to service. And our students, too, might be aware of the same. And if we would retain the seminary, the issues of prestige, or the temptation of being prestigious and the, the temptations of uh, raising a lot of money would be lessened. We would be free from that. In most of the universities, trustees and administrators are interested in nothing less 
than bringing money and prestige into those, into those institutions. Most of the faculty and students, uh, like I have said, uh, whom God has called to the ministry, respond to God's calling with that knowledge that, yeah, I am in the ministry not basically for money, but because God has called me. The other advantage is that maintain, maintaining of the seminary preserves its mission and vision. When a seminary becomes university, the first part of the ministry that changes is the vision of the school. And when that changes, the mission of the school also changes. And with this loss of our vision and our mission comes the fifth advantage whereby we talk of the influence of the faculty of theology. I, I, I don't know much, but I think some of us may be working with universities. All our seminaries have become part of the university. The voice of the faculty of theology is usually not heard within the, within the university. The voice of the seminary is not usually heard within the university. And most of the times, the Department of Theology is not given an opportunity of making decisions on the direction of that particular university. And therefore, we need to be careful when we turn our seminaries into universities, because one of, one of the areas that is going to be sacrificed will be the seminary. And with that, it is my desire and prayer th that we would pray that God may help us to maintain that which we have started for his glory and for training the ministers of the church. And as we carry out the great commission that God has entrusted us with,